10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. This is Dr. Tommy Anelli, and this is the Croc Podcast. Who is your superhero? When I grew up in the 1960s, there was Batman and there was Superman, and that was kind of about it. Uh, Then the Marvel Universe came and all these different superheroes with different superpowers came on. I am Dr. Tommy and Ellie welcoming you to another Croc Podcast. Hello, Croc Nation. To my left is the great Professor Angel Santana, the best podcast godfather, friend, spiritual warrior in the entire universe. Angel, how are you this Wednesday afternoon? I am good. I have to tell you that the last time we spoke, I said that the view was good. And yet we look out your window. It's partly cloudy. It's windy, but you still got a good view. It's a good view because you know why? We're on the right side of the dirt. You know what I'm saying? True. There you go. True. I am so excited about today's podcast. We're going to start a new module, but I did have a question. You didn't answer me. You know that I was just kind of asking the question out in the air, but who was your superhero? Mine was Superman, Christopher Reeves, Superman. Christopher Reeves, Superman. Superman. Got it. Yeah, has to be him. So let me ask you a question. So we have been finishing up. We just finished up our first module, our first learning module, Defining Survivorship. Uh, Started a second module with Surveillance. And then I was thinking to myself, you know, the Croc Nation needs many things. Our croc survivors, our cancer survivors need many resources. And sometimes that resource will be in the in the disguise of information. Sometimes you will need information and you can come to to our to our site and you will achieve that. Sometimes you need advice and we are here to to hopefully help you with that. Sometimes you just need a different point of view, um, how to interface with your doctors Uh, what questions to ask, those types of things. And sometimes you don't even know the questions and and sometimes you just need a different point of view. But sometimes I was thinking you just need to be inspired. Sometimes you just need a hero. And this new module, we're going to call it Heroes, is going to be an inspirational module. And we are going to do something very interesting, Angel. We are going to make this very interactive. So, You are going to tell us during our break how a person, one of our podcast listeners, one of our Croc Nation people might have a hero of their own that they want us to talk about or they want to talk about on this on this um, on this platform. And, And we want to sort of develop this. So that's sort of where we're going with this module. But I wanted to say that as far as heroes go and all kidding aside about superheroes and superpowers, who are our heroes. Um, This is the day and age of the coronavirus. So a lot of us, some of our superheroes are doctors and nurses. Um, They could be our first responders. These are the people who really stepped up and really have shown some backbone over the last 18 months. And and again, not a bad, not a bad hero to have. Uh, Some people would consider their mom or dad, their hero, right? Some people might um, be really, um, in ad- have admiration for somebody who's serving in the military, active military service. I think that's a really good choice as well, right? Yeah. Our policemen, our firemen, our military. Um, how about a civil leader? How about somebody like a Martin Luther King or somebody who um, ha- really changed the game for us as, as far as people, as humans, really uh, enriched our human experience? Uh, some people, it might be an iconic athlete who inspires them. But imagine this. Here's what I want you to think about. What if you had a hero that not only had to establish themselves as such in the in the struggles of day-to-day life with all the challenges and obstacles that we have on our human journey, but what if they were also cancer survivors? Our first guest today to start us off on this hero module is my dear friend, Michael John Benzea. Welcome, my dear friend. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys. How are you? 
We are doing great. Uh, Michael is on the West Coast in Hollywood. Uh, you hear uh, me speak his name every week because if it wasn't for Michael and Charlotte, uh, we would not be uh, airing this podcast. So, of course, gratitude for, for launching this podcast and helping us reach all these deserving cancer patients and cancer survivors. But more importantly, I'm going to take you out of the role as Michael John Benzea, um, our, our benefactor, our, our generous patron. Um, but I didn't meet you that way. I didn't meet you when you were a famous actor. Yeah. I met you when you were just a snotty kid um, <laughs> whose mother was my patient and who whose mother just captured my heart. She captured my soul. Um, I got to see her in the beginning of her journey, and I got to see her at the end of her journey, and I got to know you. I got to know your father. I got to know your brother, and I really got to know a person who, in my opinion, defines survivorship. Now, I'm, I consider myself, again, back to my sports analogies, I feel like Lou Gehrig. I mean, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world because every day I meet a hero. I think every cancer survivor is a hero. Um, I spoke about um, my um, colon cancer, rectal cancer surveillance module. We talked about my grandfather, who was my personal hero. But on a daily basis, I have 50 or 60 heroes that I'm dealing with uh, on any given day, and I'm inspired daily. Um, But when I think about the prototypical survivor, I think about somebody who's not just uh, coming to the table with grace and dignity in their journey with cancer, but also the way they live their personal life and how they balance the two um, and how they achieve all that they achieve, even in light of cancer. And I think, Mike, your mom represents that to me. Um, And and I I have this beautiful two-page Um, tome that you wrote in honor of your mom. And this episode is called A Mother's Love. So I I wanted you to take it from when you were young um, about your mom's upbringing. She had a lot of challenges. And this is way before, you know, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And then she met your dad and, and, you know, take us through the early years of, of Edie. Yeah. um, I second what you're saying. And I think that anyone that is going through treatment or has been through treatment, um, just survivors. I have, I have so much respect and I look to them for inspiration as well. And my mom had, like you said, prior to getting diagnosed, which I think I was around sixth grade, um, whatever age that is, sixth grade, when she was diagnosed. And then she passed away my um, when I was in college, my uh, October of uh, my first year of college. But prior to that, she had a life. And it's, it's interesting because we don't think it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I came to terms with that my mom had a life prior to me. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else can relate, but you think of your mom as your mom and she's, you know, packing your lunch and doing all the things that moms do. And then you find out, you hear little tidbits from friends of hers from the past, or you find a picture and then you ask your dad and all of a sudden unravels her, who she really is, all the layers of her. And that was something that I started to discover after she passed away. To an extent, um, the last couple of years when she was with us, there were questions I would ask and she was an open book, but she wasn't one to push her life on you. She was one, if you asked, she would answer, but she wouldn't um, go putting it out there. Um, so it was, it was refreshing that before she passed, I was able to get a little bit into what she went through prior. But, um, you know, my mom grew up extremely poor. They were from the Bronx, my dad as well. They, I remember one specific story my mom saying that she really uh, she had to play with the toys next door, like one of the dolls next door, because they couldn't afford to have dolls. And my dad would have to put car, which I, you know, we take this for granted. But my dad had to put cardboard in his shoes because when it would rain, they were that poor that the holes in the shoes, there was nothing else they could do. Uh, my mom came up from a family of you know seven brothers and sisters. Dad wasn't around. Um, we we know today because self-reflection and therapy and healing is is such a pivotal part of our society which is a a beautiful blessing but at that time um that wasn't something that they looked to it wasn't you know they didn't self-reflect they didn't go to therapy they didn't try to analyze or figure out where all these maybe somewhat triggers come from and for her to make it to where she was um raising me is astonishing that 
there wasn't more turmoil on a daily basis or there wasn't things holding her back. She really was a survivor of what she was born into, as many people are. And I think that we're learning today as well. I think there's been a universal um, awakening and we're seeing it in injustice. We're seeing it in um everything you know the world is starting to wake up to what we've been kind of sleeping on and i think my mom was uh prior to her time i think that a lot of people today have what she has and are coming into their own authentic power but my mom did this back before it was uh before many people were awake to this so um just to to sum it up yes she had a really tough childhood she had a really tough first um two marriages um disrespected uh, not appreciated. And I think that through that, her empathy grew, um, her empathy for other people, her empathy for struggles. I remember many times, uh, she would be in, you know, she was a teacher at the school and many of the students who felt like they were an outcast or, you know, um, there was one student who got pregnant very early on. These were all people that turned to my mom. And I always thought, Oh, my mom is beautiful. My mom dresses stylish, you know, they feel connected, but I didn't understand that what they were connecting to was her, struggle was her empathy was her depths of of love that were oozing out because of what she had experienced that is what made the woman that um that they were connecting to and then when she was challenged with um not just one battle with cancer this was a a continuous for many years every you know a couple of years we were dealing with a different thing uh it spread to the bone and you know that many cancer patients everything that comes along with treatment I uh, started to see that. I started to see where that was coming from and learning her prior life helped me understand who she was. And uh, that that would be in a nutshell kind of where she was coming from and what developed her into the woman that, you know, we love and respected and that you were uh, blessed and I was blessed to have as a mom and, and still do, you know, spiritually. Absolutely. And, and I see so many, I, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to start with Edie's life on this on this sort of um, module or this track was was because she does represent many qualities that I see in 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 many of my my patients, many of my friends who are survivors, and that's that resiliency. I, I think you mentioned her hard upbringing actually made her stronger. Uh, actually gave her probably that was probably the graduate school of being able to endure cancer is is going through all that she went through. Um, so that's for sure. The other thing that I was, that was remarkable about your mom um, was that she never lost the positive attitude. I never saw her lose that. And I never saw her lose her dignity, her grace and her amazing, I would say her style, right? Her bling, just like her whole persona. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Her, uh, yes, she was definitely, I mean, in the physical form, stylish. And, uh, you know, ever on the on the new trends. And I remember, I don't know if, uh, when she came to your door, if she was still rocking the high heels. She was rocking. Oh, my God. Yes, she was. Of course she was. <laughs> Where my love of shoes and Jason's love of shoes probably comes from as well. But she uh, she was a city girl and she moved to the country, but she never lost that uh, that player for style. And I think that was seen in her energy as well. I think she it uh, I think she exuberated a light. I think it was from within. I think that's something that we can't fake. Her light, Michael, was blinding. That yeah. her her essence was blinding. Yeah. And I don't think she ever, the sad thing, um, not to bring it there, but I don't think she ever fully recognized and understood the power that she had. And though the um the authentic the authenticity that she had, I think that she um she uh you know she lived and she worked and she loved. But I don't I think she was so humble that she never really even noticed what she was wielding. But she did it and and she changed lives. She did. And she was a great representative of exactly what are some of the you know, when our cancer survivors come to this podcast, some of them are early in the journey and they're just trying to figure out their style or how to actually get through. Forget about the day, just trying to get through the moment. And I think they're looking for examples like Edie because she lived her life when she was a cured survivor and she lived her life when she was a, uh, a terminal survivor. Um, but she lived her life exactly the same in both modes. Yeah. And what you said was pivotal. And I think that's a reminder that many people have to um, look at is that uh, day by day. And that was a big thing with her was that 
right now this is in front of us and this is what even when she would speak to me i remember the first time she sat me down specifically and she said our life is about to change and i remember back then meanwhile this is a, a there's memes everywhere change is inevitable i love like this is what what we're living right now back then change was i think scarier because we were we weren't as uh, self aware as we are today as a as a nation as a, as a people so i remember sitting down and saying that you know our life is about to change and that's okay and we're going to roll with it and we're going to go day by day and i don't know what next year is going to bring um but right now i know that i'm healthy and i'm fighting this and then every you know and i think that came from you guys as well i think that was she looked to you as to be her advocate as many of your patients do and that is i know you personally but i know that is how you deal with everything when it comes to someone's treatment it's like what do we have in front of us right now and what are we going to conquer right now and that's how i think you you were definitely pivotal in building her up as we were and and her background and what she went through but you were a, a key component to that michael you mentioned something that was so many different parts i've under, i mean if angel when you look at this piece of paper it's so you've written up and scratched over because there's so much depth to this to this tome um you mentioned mom knew this because she operated in love when you operate in love, you operate in truth. And if you want to be above the curve, truth is where you find that. What a beautiful sentence that is, or several sentences. It's so beautiful. It really does represent your mother. Yeah, I think that she embodied what we're all searching for. We're, I think, number one, I think everybody has it in them. I, I think that many times we get confused that we have to search externally to find our power or the love. Um, but actually it's, it's in you. And I think that was what her life lesson was. I think her journey was about discovering self-love. Um, I think she finally did. And I think that's where her, her power came from. And I think that that love that she then um, poured into me and Jason, I am now able to pour into other people. I'm full because she was able to fill me up. And I think the most important factor of this conversation to take anything away from that is that the reason why I am where I am today, the reason why my mom is, um, has done that work for me is because at those pivotal years where I am discovering who I am, she was loving me unconditionally. And if you can love a child unconditionally, we then believe, and I am a product of this, that the universe, that what I'm trying to accomplish, anything I'm trying to accomplish is limitless, that I can find love, that I can do anything in my career, that I can you know, I can I can move mountains because at those pivotal years where I am maybe not as secure in myself, she's putting that love into me. And that is a mother's job. And that's right there. Um, what I believe the hero is. And also that safe environment you mentioned a few times. Um, Mom loved you unconditionally because you were quite a knucklehead of a kid. I remember uh, <laughs> you were definitely the odd bird for sure. Um, you know, and she just let you be you and. She put you in drama classes and she let you basically, you know, just be you, right? I mean, that's what she did. And she made you feel safe about it. Yeah, I think that was the biggest thing was that realizing that, and you know, me and Jason, my brother and I are, are very different and we both have our great qualities. But Jay was, uh, you know, into the sports and he kind of, to an extent, fell in line. He also didn't, I had a, uh, I, I, I had like to uh, quote, quote unquote express myself and I would express myself to teachers and, and I talked a lot and, you know, there's many times that mom would have to get called in and they'd be like, he's asking a lot of questions. <laughs> and then, you know, there's the, the Christmases where I want a Chia pet. I think I told you or a, or a ventriloquist <laughs> doll. So I was, I was a definitely different um, than anything we have seen and maybe my cousins or my friends and my mom had a role with that, but she didn't, she didn't bat an eye. It was kind of I want you to share that with the world. So she never stifled that. And I wonder if that is because maybe she felt as a child that she, was, she wasn't she was able to maybe live as authentic. So she wanted to make sure that my childhood was that of um, very comfortable, you know, in love. Yeah. And, and I also, um, you mentioned about shame. She never made you feel shame. That was not even a word in your language. It, it isn't in my language today. And I don't think that's because of me. I think that because, listen, we can look anywhere in society to find reasons to feel shameful and who's telling us to feel shameful and what product we need, because it will make us not feel shameful, you know. But my mom 
there was never there was definitely um, trial and error, and there was definitely a balance of like this is not okay, and um, you might have done something wrong, but there was never a shame to doing something wrong. It was a learning experience, and then there was never a shame to um, living in your authentic power of who you are. That was never on the table. When I first met your mom, um, gosh, it was way, I want to say 20 years ago, it was kind of coexistent with when we started the Cancer Survivorship Group. Um, and I met Jay, your dad and everybody, and um, they were part of the the Croc family. And, uh, you know, again, she inspired me throughout her entire um, survivorship. And, and I don't even know if you know this, but Angel doesn't know this, but I knew Michael when he was young and Michael won our first Croc um, scholarship. We had two scholarships that we gave out uh, for students of survivors and Michael uh, won won the first one. And, oh, and that's how we first met, met Mike. Uh, do you remember that night, Michael? I have a photo. I have to send it to you. I have a photo. <laughs> My mom at the time, I think um, she might have been, uh, I think she might have been uh maybe in and out of the hospital at that time. But I remember her, I think she was in a wheelchair maybe then, but I have a photo with her in the wheelchair holding this giant. By the way, that was like a huge, that was so cool to me because I had never won really anything that cool, but it was like a huge banner that Dr. Yee had that it was a scholarship. And uh, yeah, I remember exactly. And I have a photo from it. I'll have to send it to you. But yeah, that was a beautiful moment for me and my mom. And um, that's when we, that's when we first met, I think. Right. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And, and, and life is funny and, and people will say an angel would be the first one to say, uh, funny is the wrong word. Life makes sense because all of these things, all of these coincidences are not coincidences. They happen for a reason. And here's this kid, uh, this kid with the ventriloquist doll <laughs> and the chia pet. Um, you know, being raised by this awesome cancer survivor who I loved, 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 loved. And he goes off to school. He always has it in the back of his mind. He wants to do drama. He wants to do acting. Um, he finishes his medical degree. You know, he did his uh, medical training in radiology. And he goes and he says to his dad, you know what? I want to go make a stake for myself and head out to the West Coast. And Michael, you look like your mother. Um, you're like your mother in many, many ways, all the strong things that she passed on to you. And pick it up from there. Now, mom's not with us anymore. And you're out, you know, and believe me, if I think that, you know, the medical world is difficult, you know, the medical world and you know, the acting world. I bet you the medical world is like, is like a, a walk around the park compared to the, to the acting world. <laughs> it uh it's definitely two different universes but they they are definitely uh share a lot of similarities they're uh i wouldn't be able to, to do what i'm doing now if i didn't have my medical training and if i didn't have the upbringing i had but like like i tell people all the time they're like what's the uh what's the biggest difference or similarity i said well in both fields as an actor if i don't effectively listen to the other actor or whoever's in a scene with me, it's not going to be organic and it's not going to be truthful and it's just going to be rehearsed. And, and we've seen it. We've seen bad acting. In the medical field, if I do not, and this is something, Dr. you do amazingly well, is you, you effectively listen to your patients. You don't write down and then look away and then, you know, everybody, it, it, patients are not a number. You spend the time with them and that is something that I did as well with my radiology patients. I There was many times where I was like, oh, can you take this patient because I'm still speaking to this woman and she still needs my time. And I think that's what happens in um, in life is we just quickly are moving on to the next thing and what, what do we have to do? And, and we're, we're forgetting to live in the moments. And that is the biggest thing for the medical field uh, besides listening and when it comes to acting is if I'm not living in the moment I, I'm just wasting my time and everybody else's. So I think. Those and I see that I see your mother in you in that regard, in the sense that getting back to genuineness, getting back to real and truth, you know, life is in love and love is in truth. And that, that's kind of what you represent to me. And, and Angel, getting back to that comment of that I said about everything being for a reason, um, when Edie left us, you know, Michael was young and he was just in his first year of school and there was something within him in his spirit that wanted to give back to survivors. 
And when he first was in the position to give back, um, it was when we were still doing our dinners and our lectures and things. And then when we were helping with the patient support grants that we did for eight years, Mike and, 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 and Charlotte um, were there for us. They basically believed in us no matter what we were doing. So it makes sense to me that Michael's never going to leave the cancer survivorship world. He's never going to let down a cancer survivor. So it just makes a lot of sense to me. And believe me, Mike, this is not you. This is from your mom. And and that is one of the reasons why I wanted to, to start with this particular episode. Um, I wanted to ask you, when you are going through your day, and, you know, there's a lot on your plate. You have a lot going on. You have agents and you have you know, what would you guys call auditions, right? We call them interviews, auditions, and, you know, you're trying to get this part or that part and this and that. Um, do you talk to your mom? Do you guys speak? Do you guys have conversations? Does she give you signs on what to do? Yeah. Uh, does she give me signs? Yeah, I, it is. So, okay. So I, I grew up um, Catholic and I went through the motions as we all do. And I think I love the Catholic religion. Um, I love all religions, but as I started to awaken and I got older, and this is for me personally, um, mom's cancer treatment. And then when mom passed away, I was 18. That was kind of a, a bigger wake up call. And then about maybe four years ago, I had an even bigger wake up call where I was, I couldn't unsee what I now see. And with that, I started to pray for um, gifts like prophecy or discernment or just to be able to navigate this crazy life that I'm now living in a whole nother state with, you know, I moved out here with a couple of friends. They moved back. What am I doing? And there's many times where you're sitting up and you, well, I specifically remember the first year I was out here on my inflatable couch, which by the way, I popped many times with my keys and brought it back to Kmart and said, Hey, listen, I don't know what happened. I need another one. Mike versus Kmart. <laughs> yeah, that's, Kmart was the spot, but this is the, the, I, I, I took a risk and I jumped because I knew that in me, there was more to accomplish. Not that having my radiology job, you know, at RMC wasn't, you know, enough. I just felt there was more I had to do. So out here put and taking that jump, that's when I started to rethink, like, we need to look back at our spirituality. And, and mom is my key person, obviously, because she's the person who has been closest to me and I come from and her love is in me. So that is who I turn to. I turn to a higher source. I turn to God. I, you know, and I, I started to navigate my spirituality. So back to your question, um, yeah, signs, I, I asked for them, I embraced them. And at first, me, like seven years ago, I remember getting dreams and signs and things where I was like, whoa, all right, that's enough. Like, we'll, we'll ease into this. Because once you open up that realm of spirituality, you start to see things and feel things. And you're like, maybe I'm better just staying still. And that uh, for me, if I want those blessings, if I want to touch the lives that I want to touch, then I have to jump in full and I have to trust that I will be okay and that where I'm being navigated is where I'm supposed to be. So like I tell my dad all the time, right now I'm an actor. It's just a label. I was an x-ray tech. It, it literally is just a label. I'm just a vessel for a higher source for love um, to be used a certain way. So if I have to be a, a zoologist next week, well, I'll put the hat on and God will show me what I need to do to accomplish that. God will put those pivotal people, like we said before, synchronicities. I don't believe in luck. I believe in working really hard, doing the work on yourself internally, because that's where love is. That's where your God is. And once you do that work, the people will come in. The opportunities, I don't search out any of these opportunities that I have accomplished. And listen, I am not where I envision myself to be. Anything that I have accomplished in the last seven years in this field and in the other field, I didn't get because I worked extremely hard and tried to and was, met this one and then went to this party. No, no. It was like where I'm like, how did this even, oh my God, I didn't even know they know so-and-so. And then they spoke to it. Amazing things have happened in my career that I could not have planned. And I know that is because I let go of control and I decided what is more important is to love other people, to love myself and uh, to do a, a higher, a higher thing than what I, you know, than selfish means. And don't get me wrong. I enjoy 
the process and I enjoy when I book a job and I enjoy seeing, you know, the work come to life and working on the craft. But I know there is a greater, greater purpose to what my journey is. And, and I think that, you know, bringing this all together now um, as, as a survivorship um, hero um, episode, here's what the take home message that I see uh, for our Croc Nation. You're not just a cancer survivor. You're a mother. You're a father. You're a sister. You're a brother. You could be a first responder. You could be working uh, at Orange County Bagels. It doesn't matter where you are, but re- remember, remember Edie Benzea. She was a mother. She was a hero. She was a courageous fighter. She was a survivor. She brought this with her. She she then handed it down to her children. Her children take this with them wherever they go, and they succeed, and they succeed because of you guys. Make no mistake about it. Being a mother, being a father, being a parent is just as effective as being the most important neurosurgeon, politician, lawyer, Indian chief in the entire universe. And this episode, honoring Edie Benzea and her life as a hero to young Michael is what it's all about. I hope you all in podcast land in the our Croc Nation were able to derive some inspiration from today's story, from today's interview. I hope that you were able to derive some small piece, some small floatable object that you could hold on to and and use in your own journey. And and Michael, I'm going to let Angel, as he always does, um, ask a few questions and see if, if he has any perspectives that I may have missed. First and foremost, I never got to meet your mom. Um, I felt like we were in her presence today. Um, I don't want to, like you, I'm not going to take it to that spirituality, but I'm going to say this. I, two things struck me when you were describing the life that your mom had. And when you and I have a lot of similarities in the sense of, you know, I grew up in a family where my father would sit down and make miracles, as he would call it. Um, he would figure out where he could uh, not pay one bill so that we can have a Christmas. So, so that was the one thing that, that struck me uh, personally. I, I, I understand. Um, my first question to you is, when you, were, um, when you were deciding where you wanted to be, you said you were going to go into the medical. Did you get into the medical field before you met Dr. Ianelli? Or, or was this something inspired because of that? No, I, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I knew that I wanted to help people. And I think my mom's situation and meeting Dr. Inelli and then going, I think I went with her to her chemo treatments. I was kind of along the ride. And I, I said to my mom, I think this might be a good bet. And then I remember shadowing you Doc, and uh, saying, this is probably it. I didn't, at the time, selfishly, I, I didn't see myself being um, maybe there all day long. I, I am very much, I have to kind of do different things. I want to switch it up. And radiology is the perfect for anyone that might be looking into a career that loves a challenge, loves to think with both sides of their brain. Radiology was was the spot for me because there was also um, no cap. I was an x-ray tech and a CT tech. You can do MR, you can go into special procedures. There's so many different places. I even went into management. So it was like a playground for me. So yeah, I think that my mom's situation, I think meeting doctors um, like Dr. Ianelli and and um, nurses and um, other, the biggest thing, this was the biggest thing. I remember going to the, I, I don't know if they still call it the Tucker Center at ORMC, which isn't even ORMC anymore. It's now Garnet. Yeah, Garnet. Garnet. Yeah. Hell, it, yeah. This is dating me now, Horton Hospital. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. <laughs> Horton and Arden Hill were two separate places. Yeah. And I remember working in medical records because it was my first job. So that's where I started before I even met you, Doc. Yeah, uh, yeah. Medical records. And I used to go up and visit my mom in the Tucker Center when she was in, um, when she would bounce in and out of the hospital. And I remember the nurses there being the most warm nurses um, and the other patients that I would meet, their ages would range um, from young to older and meeting them and speaking to them about what they had experienced and um, their outlook on life. They just, they just got it. They just cancer, cancer patients and can- survivors, you know, cause you say uh, from day one, you are, you know, you're doing this, you're surviving, you are a survivor. You don't earn like, this is it. Um, 
they, they truly inspire me because they get life. There's a lot of people that go through life and it takes a while to wake up. And these people, they just get it. They, and I wanted a piece of that. I wanted to understand what they saw, what they, why they looked at life so differently. Um, and I think that's why ultimately underneath it all, that's why I went into the medical field because there was something that they had that I wanted to, to learn. And that, and, and that segues into my final thought. Mm. When you described all the things that have happened to you, we'll call them quote unquote signs. When we describe all the things that have happened that was a part of your life, this is my personal message to you. You, I always say this on my show. We as men are a direct reflection of our spouse, of our parents and of our mother. You are a direct reflection of your mom. When you speak about your mom, when this eventually goes on air and he's, and you get the shine that comes off of you, the warmth that comes off of you is so powerful, so inspiring that I only wish that you can see what I see when you talk about your mom. I can tell you that nothing happens by accident. Where you are today is because of who you are, who you've become, who you're going to be, and who you stem from, and that's your mom. Exactly. And Michael, I I hope you know this. That um, another reason why this is such an important, um, you know, podcast module about heroes is because people who are related to our survivors or friends with our survivors, whether they be children or whether they be spouses or friends or coworkers, you guys are also called survivors. And that's not just coming from me and our croc podcast. This is coming from the actual definition of survivorship from, you know, the National Institute of Health. So a cancer survivor is a person who has been diagnosed with cancer and a cancer survivor is a person who is involved with the survivor. So you likewise, Jay, Jason, you guys are all survivors. Um, the, the grandkids, you guys are all survivors from Edie. So don't ever think um, that, that this is just about her or our survivors. It's about um, the caregivers as well. So, so remember that. Yeah, we truly are a tribe. And you are, we are, we are a tribe. tribe. And, you know, I have to tell you, um, well, actually, before I get to that, let me just ask you, because, you know, you know how much I like to talk and I get yelled at every week about how much I talk, but <laughs> I will say the following. We, we, same <laughs> I know but, this is going to be a 17 hour podcast <laughs> marathon. So, <laughs> so, Michael, I always ask our guests and we've had some really uh, amazing guests and you are certainly right there. Um, Do you have any questions of Angel and I or anything you'd like to share with our podcast nation, with our croc nation, our survivors? Um, Any questions for you guys? Well, specifically, what do you see your, uh, you know, who said this? uh, She says this often and I'm going to, piggyback off of her, but I I love this question. I've seen her ask it. Oprah says this a lot. She wants to know what people, uh, what they feel like their legacy will be. So to you guys, um, what do you think your legacy is that you're working on where your, what your legacy will be? And I I am so glad you asked that. It's almost as if I asked you to ask us that (laughs) because Angel and I have already said it. And, you know, Angel has a faith-based podcast and we have a educational slash um, inspirational podcast for cancer survivors, but we both agree with the following thing. If this particular podcast, this is our heroes uh, module um, episode one, um, a mother's love uh, celebrating the life of Edie Benzea. If there is one person out there who listens to this podcast, who has breast cancer, who is a mother, who has children who are young and they're just trying to figure out how they are going to balance being a mother, being a great mother and being a courageous cancer fighter and being a warrior and getting through treatments you mentioned in your paper, um, mom closing the door of the bathroom and you can kind of tell she's throwing up, but she walks Mm -hmm. out of that bathroom with a smile on her face. Um, For those cancer survivors who are just trying to figure out 
uh, they have a child who's a little special or a little different and they have enough on their mind. They have a CAT scan or a PET scan coming up. And yeah. what do I do with this kid? How do I embrace this kid and, and, and help um, accent- have him express or, or sh- her express herself to the best of my ability? If there's one person out there who takes Edie's life, who takes Edie's legacy and is able to derive that from what Angel and I created here through the benefaction and and the patronage of you and Charlotte, that is my only goal. If we touch a trillion people, fantastic. If we can generate, you know, enough donations to, to put to research to cure cancer, that's even better. We, we, we always say in the industry, we want to be run out of work. We want to get fired because there is no cancer. We want to work in 7-Eleven and make slushies. I want to make shrimp slushies because I'm both hungry and thirsty at the same time. Um, so that's kind of what we want to do. Angel, in your po- faith-based ca- podcast, Have um, Faith, Let It Begin. Same thing. You know, again, things don't happen by accident. We got put together. Yes. And the first thing he would ask me was, what is it about your show? So on my show, Have Faith, Let It Begin, is if I can touch one person, one person, whether that's one episode, whether that's my 800, I've done my job. And that was the same thing he said before I said it. He just wants to touch one person. So I can guarantee you, because I've already been touched from this episode, I can't begin to imagine how many are going to be touched. And Michael, actually, to, to even make it even better, is that I think there was a time, you know, because don't forget, being in, um, an advocate for cancer survivors for going on our third decade here, right? 20 something years. Um, I think when I was a younger man, I think it meant more to me to be recognized, but now as an older man with no hair and a, uh, and I don't really really look good in a speedo anymore. I I actually never did look good in a speedo, Mike. Um, But the truth of the matter is that I really, my legacy, I want to be able to give information and inspire and help, but not because of me. I want it to be, this is a podcast that is owned by the constituency of cancer survivors. I am just here to kind of drive the bus, but this survivor bus is your bus. This is Edie's bus. Uh, This is Mikey's bus. This is Angel's bus. This is anybody who cares to get on in this bus. And that, that would be the way I would answer that legacy question. Yeah, there's, and that you asked uh, the two questions you said, you know, you guys, and then in regards to cancer survivors, which is a wide priority, it's families and friends and those actually dealing with the treatment. And I think that's the most powerful part about it to take from this is that looking at me, not me specifically, but how I got to where I am, what I'm doing, how the things, synchronicities came together. I think what we learned as a cancer survivor, as a family of a cancer survivor, as my mom herself, is that when we started to recognize the power that we have as cancer survivors, as those going through the treatment, as those who are affected, that um, when we operate in love, we are unstoppable. And um, I think that would be the biggest takeaway is that it can be overwhelming and it was overwhelming for us. I mean, life is overwhelming. This past year has been overwhelming. But once we stand firm in our space and we own our space, um, there's power in that. And that, that is love. And I think that's what cancer survivors have over the rest um, of the world is that they, they get that and they see that. And if they don't see it right now, it's okay, but they will. Um, and early on, it can be, like we said, extremely, um, it shakes your whole world. But it shakes it for the better in the in the long run, if that makes somewhat sense. Oh, it makes a ton of sense. Edie Benzea, thank you for your life. To our cancer survivors, thank you for your life. Angel Santana, thank you for being the greatest producer in the world. Michael Benzea, Charlotte Larson, thank you for your generosity because this is all because of you two. Rod Freeman, the greatest social media man ever, small biz up. I want to thank everyone out there for listening. This has been a wonderful, um, I would say, uh, initiation of a new module. And I can't wait to share more. Angel, we're going to have you um, put in a plug for how our listeners can nominate someone who is their hero to come in to talk about them. 
Yes. Yeah, so right now we're working on a platform that's going to be launching on the website. So um, we're going to put that in the description because it hasn't been finalized just yet. So it will be on the website where you can actually nominate or actually try to get on to our podcast because everyone is welcome and you'll be able to nominate a hero. So look out for that. Look out for that on our Twitter accounts. We're going to actually let you know when that launches and with the way Rod works, that's going to be very, very quickly. No, it sounds perfect. And um, everyone out there, uh, do not be, uh, don't worry. Michael Benzea will be back. He's going to actually help co-host our uh, complimentary medicine segments and module. Uh, he, you know, California, there are a bunch of nuts out there. There's a lot of creative things going out on the West Coast that he's going to share with us. That'll make your life better. Uh, in closing, we close every episode exactly the same. Angel and I, as well as Michael Benzea, wish you all a very long, healthy, happy, and cancer-free life. This is your friend, Dr. Tommy and Ellie, signing off on another podcast. God bless you. Peace. And we will see you next week.